I somewhat recommend getting the tables out of the way and then people just sit, but okay. uh, it's up to you. Um, can everybody see this? Hey guys, can you see um, this is this back? visible? Yeah. If not, move up. Oh, there's the, there's not going to be anything to read. Tone, what was the block size of Bitcoin Law? What do you mean, block size? Like weird, um, oh, block there, there was no block size when Bitcoin launched. Yeah, yeah. Were saying that they had a, a, a hard fork to get to the one megabyte. They actually, it was a soft fork to get to the one megabyte. You have to hard fork to get out of it now. Go, going oh, really? down no, no, is a no, soft no. fork, so going soft up is a hard fork. You can yeah. use a soft fork to go down. Yes, because yes. there were no blocks that were yes. bigger than that at that time. Yes. If there had been a block that in the past was bigger than right. one megabyte, it would be a hard but fork. But how, right. how do you soft fork? Because you're going down. So basically, newer blocks can have to be less. Let's say they want to create, let's say we want to cut the block size in half. That means all the blocks that are going to be created going forward are going to be less than uh, a one megabyte. It will be half a megabyte, right? But the back blocks don't need to be moved around the system anymore. No. So your old transactions are perfectly compatible. Like you don't have to do anything. You don't need to upgrade the code. You just soft fork that um, to create new blocks to be lower. But bigger blocks would still be accepted. Um, bigger blocks will kind of still be accepted, uh, but not going forward, right? Like if everyone adopts the new code, yeah. right? That code becomes the code. Yeah. Everyone Bitcoin adopted the one megabyte code. How did they find one blocks? No one was using it. So, what so point somebody, did that come no in? one's using it, right? So, so the blocks were like, there was like four transactions a day. Right. So you're not going to fill up a block. I understand that, but what point did they have to go put a? So because they because they realized that spam is gonna is gonna destroy Bitcoin. So they added a block size limit. They also realized that uh, like the firewall of China creates a problem moving a big block, right? So for example, if a big block is found in China. By the time that block moves around the world and gets verified, the miner that found that block is already way ahead at finding the next block. So you can have a situation where one miner finds every single block uh, one after the other because they have the advantage of large blocks. It's one of the problems with large blocks. Well, I'm happy to be here at the uh, Philadelphia meetup. Uh, this is great. I actually want pictures like with, with I, I want like like th as much of the background as possible because I want to tweet this out later and ask my followers a question because I have thousands of followers now. Um, Tone Vay speaking in Philadelphia, 2012 or 2017? <laughs> <laughs> So this is great. Oh, actually, it's, it, it, it's such a contrast. The is, last is this like this, the smallest Bitcoin meetup that exists in the world? Um, no. I don't. I don't know about the Francis smallest. I, I don't know about the <laughs> smallest, but it's definitely like uh, it, it's definitely old school because the last meetup I spoke at was in Toronto and it was over 400 people <laughs> for a three-hour meetup about the same amount of time as uh, yours. Your meetup. There, they get over 400 people they have to like fly in speakers for that one because it's like a big because like, it has to be serious um, so I spoke with that one uh, once I spoke at their last meetup it was great I strongly recommend it all right so uh, here's my background my name is Tone Vase um, I am former Wall Street and it kind of sounded cool when I came here now it sounds like sketchy but from everything I've seen in the Bitcoin space, I did not like, it's a fraction of the scamminess that I ever saw on Wall Street. In fact, like the 10 years that I've worked on Wall Street, I, as far as I know, I've never met a scammer. I've never seen a scammer. Everyone I've met was college educated and trying to do really great things, uh, which is a very, very different than what I've seen uh, here in the Bitcoin space. Uh, so that's why I started a new podcast called Crypto Scam. Uh, where I dive deep into a lot of the projects and tokens uh, in the Bitcoin space and in the crypto space in general. And one of them was about gold. So I try to dive deep and uh, 
provide all the information for my followers to decide on their own, is it or is it or isn't it a scam? Um, so that's kind of the podcast. Um, you can also um, find my um, economics uh, video blogs on my YouTube channel, just Google Tone Vase. Um, I'm also on the World Crypto Networks podcasts and I'm on a lot of random podcasts. I try to put all my work on my website, Liberty Life Trail. I'm currently completely independent. So I uh, travel and I trade and I uh, do what I want and uh, talk about Bitcoin. Now I trade traditional markets. I talk about Bitcoin and trading Bitcoin. I don't trade Bitcoin uh, so that I'm not uh, in any conflict of interest with my views on the price of Bitcoin, nor do I front run my followers. You know, I buy first and then I tell everybody I bought and then they help me bring the price up. And then I sell first and then I tell everybody I sold and then uh, they help me uh, bring the price down. And I'm, I'm getting a lot of followers now and I would never ever do that. So what I always tell people, I talk about trading of assets I don't trade and I trade assets I never talk about. Okay? Makes sense. So, so what uh, assets do you trade now? I trade options on volatile tech stocks. That's kind of my specialty. And I never talk about any single name stock trading. I'll talk about S&P 500, gold, oil, currencies. Uh, I don't talk about any, uh, any uh, equity. I don't talk about any stock individually, but that's what I actually trade in the option space. Okay, so uh, what you see on the screen is the entire history of the price of Bitcoin from about 10 cents all the way up to our 2013 high of 1300 and then are some of our most recent highs. Uh, Bitcoin changes so quickly, it takes me half a day to update the background of this presentation. So uh, this is a screenshot from about early February, but uh, maybe we can pull up the more recent charts. Uh, oh, but I'm not logged in on this computer, so maybe that won't happen. Uh, but um, so this is the entire history of Bitcoin, and I like to start off this presentation, um, even prior to Bitcoin, I like taking people back all the way to 19, um, you know what, this is gonna be a good test. I'm gonna test how well I know my own presentation by not looking at it and uh, assuming what's on the screen for you guys. <laughs> so let me know if I'm wrong. Um, so I like to take this presentation back to pre-Bitcoin. Uh, this was a statement by an uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, Paul Krugman uh, from 1998, where he was asked about the internet and he kind of said that the internet is not gonna be revolutionary. It'll amount to as much as a fax machine by 2005. Um, he was ridiculed for these statements um, a lot, tried to back down from them a little bit. But around the same time, there was another very famous economist. And uh, I don't believe we have internet here for me to play this video, but this is a one minute clip of Milton Friedman where he basically predicted Bitcoin in 1999. So if you feel like Googling when you get home, uh, Google Milton Friedman uh, predicts Bitcoin 1999. And you will listen, uh, this, the, this entire 45 minute interview was amazing. But at the very end, he clearly sta he states the following. Um, Internet is gonna go a long way to reducing the role of government. The one thing that the internet is missing is a reliable e-cash, a method by which a person on the internet uh, can transfer funds from A uh, to B without A knowing B or B knowing A. Uh, and he said this would go a long way to helping the internet like achieve what the internet needs to achieve. Um, and then he clearly states that this would also allow a lot of illeg illegal activity take place over the internet, and he was absolutely right. Uh, so that, the, the man was the genius. Unfortunately, he was not around uh, to see Bitcoin thrive. So Bitcoin launches in early 2009, and uh, it's just a hobby. It's just a hobby for a few specialists. 
and then Bitcoin finally hits its first um, media spotlight and the reason why you're seeing the country of Australia is because it came out of Australia and Australia was the home of Julian Assange who had launched WikiLeaks and in, in 2010 late 2010 uh, WikiLeaks was cut off uh, from the world financial markets. Uh, people could not send WikiLeaks money through Visa, MasterCard, or credit cards. They couldn't PayPal them money. They couldn't send the money. So WikiLeaks was on the verge of shutting down. And then Amir Taki had a great idea where he suggested WikiLeaks need to accept Bitcoin. Bitcoin was about 10 cents at the time, like 10, 20 cents at the time. So he suggested that WikiLeaks needs to accept Bitcoin as donations. And Satoshi came out and said, no, 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 we don't want that. Uh, that's going to cause a lot of attention to Bitcoin. And also, uh, technologically, we may not be ready for that kind of influx. And uh, uh, WikiLeaks actually listened. They did not accept Bitcoin in 2010. And that's, that brings us into 2011. And in 2011, um, there was a price in 2010 already? There was, about 10 cents. In the start, as of the middle of 2010. That was Mt. Gox? Uh, I believe Mt. Gox might not have even launched yet. I, I, I thought only in 11. Uh, Mt. Gox did launch in 2011, but there was some price for Bitcoin in mid-2010 okay. because a lot of hackers were paying each other for work. Uh, and they kind of priced Bitcoin at around 10 cents, uh, 10 cents per Bitcoin. So people would literally send thousands of Bitcoin to each other. A lot of it got lost because it was worthless. It was worth 10 cents a Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, but in 2011, in the summer of 2011, what we have is um, New York to thank for the giant rise of Bitcoin from one dollar to all the way to thirty dollars this is where not only has mount gox launched but also silk road has launched and um, silk road was already becoming popular to the point where our, um, our senator out in new york chuck schumer uh, decided to go on tv and blast uh, this problem basically doing a one minute infomercial for bitcoin by literally talking about this crazy website called Silk Road, where you can just buy drugs on the internet. People are using Tor. He showed how to, uh, what Tor was. He explained how to use Tor to log on to Silk Road. And then he talked about this currency called Bitcoin that's everyone using to buy the drugs. So basically, uh, this was like the greatest infomercial <laughs> that uh, Bitcoin has ever had to this day and it helped drive the price of Bitcoin from $1 to $30. And this was actually the biggest bubble that Bitcoin ever had because once it went all the way up to $30, it then crashed all the way down to $2. So, um, and um, after the crash, we slowly recovered. And by the way, right at the peak of that $30, that's also when WikiLeaks finally began accepting a Bitcoin for donations and it probably saved WikiLeaks. If WikiLeaks didn't do that, they were gonna have to shut down their servers, okay? So now this brings us to 2012. Uh, in 2012, uh, the Chinese exchanges have started entering the market. Uh, in addition, there was a huge boost in the middle of 2012 when Bitcoin was talked about on CCTV, which is the Chinese government uh, news channel. And, which is watched by 500 million people. So bigger than the population of the United States. Uh, that's how many people watch that channel. So when Bitcoin was talked about on that channel, that created a huge boost to Bitcoin that also helped, helped drive the price to about 1350. And then once again, Bitcoin had another bubble and then it crashed down um, all the way down to about 750. And this brings us to 2013. So in 2013, many things happened. For starters, in uh, around the turn of that year, the Bitcoin mining reward had cut in half. I believe it was in November of 2012, where the Bitcoin reward had dropped from 50 uh, Bitcoins per block 
down to 25 bitcoins per block. Mt. Gox was always running a fractional reserve. I have another video as part of my Crypto Scam podcast on Ripple, and I talk about the history of Mt. Gox. Because many people don't know, Mark Carpellis, who is uh, blamed for the collapse of Mt. Gox, did not create Mt. Gox. Mark Carpellis bought Mt. Gox from its creator. The creator of Mt. Gox was also the, 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 he didn't create Ripple, but he created a token out of Ripple. And um, a lot of us believe that he scammed Mark Arpelis, and when he sold the Mount Gox, he sold it to him with 80,000 missing Bitcoins. So Mark Arpelis was running a fractional reserve bank in an exchange from the very beginning, and he was not able to make it work. Uh, but he was not the scammer, he got scammed himself. Uh, and, but a lot of other people paid for it. No, Ripple Token came later. I think Ripple Token came in like 2013 or maybe late 2012. But Ripple Token came after um, Jed McCaleb sold Mt. Gox to Mark Arpelis. And then he went ahead and convinced the creators of Ripple. Uh, Ripple was created in like the 90s um, or early 2000s. And then he convinced Ripple that they needed to tokenize. And then he turned Ripple into basically a scam, in my opinion, um, in order to make money. So, what, what coin other than Bitcoin is not a scam in your view? Uh, probably Litecoin isn't a scam, and maybe Monero. That doesn't mean that they're going to succeed, but at least they're honest. Now, Monero also had a bit of a hiccup in the early days, but the, that person that caused the hiccup in Monero was immediately kicked out of the community, which is the opposite of what happened in Dash. Uh, the person that caused the early on scam, which was way bigger than uh, Monero's, is still there running things. So th th that's the big difference between Dash and Monero. Uh, that would be Evan Duffield. Do you uh, have anything to say about the relationship with Dash and Dash and what? PIBX. Um, I learned about PIVX today um, um, because, oh, not really, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't care for altcoins. Um, I learned about PIVX today only because everyone was tweeting it at me and my answer to them was, in order for me to comment on uh, the scamminess of your coin, I need at least five minutes of time researching it and uh, PIVX hasn't earned the five minutes of my time yet. Uh, if, it sticks, if it makes it to the top 10 and it sticks around there for more than a minute, um, I'll take a look at it. Uh, what place is it in today? It's in the top like 20. It's in the top 20, okay. Um, I remember... Um, like, it, it was like down in like... Well, I remember I woke up like about a month ago and I glanced at my phone and I saw some coin Magna something was at number eight market cap by rank. Um, and then by... And then within two days, it was back to number 90. So it's basically a, um, a lot of these things make nothing. A lot of these things make nothing. It's a dash line. Look, I'll tell you exactly how it happens, right? There are, so, there are enough important people that run group chats that are being followed by two to 300 people. And some guy says, I just bought PIVX and 200 altcoiners buy, buy it. And then it pumps and then the leader says, I have now sold PIVX and then they all sell. And then it goes back to its position of being number 90 on the list. Like, um, I, I, I completely ignore it. This is all complete noise. Um, I only trade things where I'm the expert, not where someone else is the expert. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're back to 2013. In early 2013, Mount Gox uh, decided to start their Willy bot in order to help them become solvent which did help drive the price of Bitcoin, but like all manipulations, you can only manipulate the price within the trend. You can't manipulate the price outside of the trend. Uh, this is a big argument that I deal with with Andy Hoffman and some of the other gold promoters. Um, like it's easy to manipulate, oh, did I click the button by accident? No, I didn't, okay. Um, 
uh, it's easy to manipulate the price of Bitcoin to the upside when Bitcoin is going up. It's easy to manipulate the price of Bitcoin lower when the price of Bitcoin is going down, like every market. It's very difficult to manipulate the price down when the trend is up. It's actually impossible. Nobody can do it, right? So in 2013, there were... Do you were... want to give the little intuition behind that? Well, you, you can't fight the market. Like, not even Goldman Sachs can, right? I mean, if the... Um, every single market, we all know it's supply and demand, right? Supply for an asset versus demand for an asset, right? But it's the confidence in that asset that drives the demand, right? If, if the traders are confident in that asset, no one has enough money to move it to the other side. Of course, the asset has to be big enough, right? If it's some stock no one's heard of, then, then no, right? But if the entire world is bullish on Bitcoin, no one has the money to keep it down. Uh, and someone tried, Trend on Shavers, who is now going to prison. Unfortunately, he didn't, he didn't mean to run a Ponzi, but that's what happened. Um, uh, we'll look into that. Trend on Shavers, yes, quite another question. So you said Bitcoin is easy to manipulate the price. How about 2013, just to clarify? Yes. Today? Well, um, it's not, I, that's the thing. No, today it's not because we're not, uh, we're still in an uptrend. It's very easy to manipulate the price of Bitcoin to the upside. It's difficult to manipulate it to the downside. Even now today, that's still possible to, to manipulate the price of Bitcoin. To the upside, absolutely. Um, you, you... Well, no, just um, having a big enough voice and talking about it, right? So, uh, for example, recently with the ETF, I have a dozen videos going back a year and a half uh, if not two years, talking about how dumb the, ET the Bitcoin ETF is and how it's never gonna get passed. Um, leading into the ETF decision, uh, while the majority of the people were uh, beyond 50% uh, convinced that the ETF was gonna get approved, I was on all my blogs giving it a 5% chance, five to 10% chance of the ETF approval. So anyone coming out on TV saying, um, I'm positive the ETF is going to get approved, is gonna pump the price up, right? So some of these people know nothing. Uh, people called me and told me that they knew um, uh, financial officials appointed personally by Obama, and they know that the ETF is going to get approved. People called and told me that. And I told them, you know nothing, you're an idiot. <laughs> um, that's what I told them. I'm like, but you're a, you're a nobody. Uh, and, and some Obama appointed official wouldn't tell you this. Uh, like, it's, it's ridiculous, right? So someone going on TV and talking about, I believe there is a 60% chance the ETF is going to get approved, is easily going to pump the price of Bitcoin to the upside. And it did. The Bitcoin price went up all the way to 1300, uh, mostly because of the ETF hype. And I was on every one of my podcasts, I'm like saying, you guys are, this is nonsense. It's not going to get approved and it shouldn't get approved. Um, so that, that so something like that, right? Um, because it's easy, it's within the trend, right? It's very difficult to go on TV and try to drive the price of Bitcoin down saying that I know for a fact the, BT, the ETF is not going to get approved, sell your Bitcoin now. That's not, it, it's hard because the, the, trend, the trend of Bitcoin has been going up for uh, two years now, right? So any positive news will drive the price up. So you can manipulate Bitcoin right now if you have the viewership. If you have, if you're gonna be on Bloomberg, if you're going on Bloomberg and you're gonna speak positively about Bitcoin, you, are gonna drive the price up. You're gonna yeah, hype it up. Watches Bloomberg actually buys Bitcoin. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Have you ever watched Bloomberg? Yeah, it's me. Did you see, did you see yes. Hillary Clinton trying to go on all those shows? Yeah. So. <laughs> Sorry, what? Uh, what did you so that's what I mean, right? So you have to be silly, right? Like, like anyone that goes on TV during a bull run, and and talks about how bad things are gonna be. Nothing's gonna happen. But if you're going on TV during a bearish run and you're gonna talk about how much more bearish it's going to get and you're a high profile individual, you're creating additional panic in a bearish environment. 
So it's very easy to manipulate the price. Also, if you're a big player, right? If the price is going up and all of a sudden you go in big to drive the price up, even more people want to buy up. This is why everyone buys at the top and sells at the bottom. Um, manipulating the price in the opposite direction of the trend is very difficult and almost always unsuccessful. Um, this is why uh, all these gloom and doomers talking about the next great crash, like the Great Depression, um, they're only wrong once every eight to nine years, but they talk about it every single year. Because they can't, they, they can't do anything, because the price is going up. Right, so it's, it's mainly done sentiment and not Correct. trading volume. Correct, but, but you can also do it through trading volume, right? Again, like right now, if someone, we're in a bull run. If someone tries to like dump a lot of Bitcoin, people will just buy up, buy up the dip, right? You're better off creating a euphoria to buy it and then selling everything you got at the, after it goes up. So it's, it's always easier to manipulate price within the trend, whether it's uh, through media or through trading. Um, oh, that's okay. No, I haven't. I haven't been paying attention to that. I've been just too busy to actually look at the volume. And because I don't actually trade Bitcoin, um, it it's not that interesting to me. Uh, I, I talk about it after it happens. I'm like, oh, I can tell you why that happened. But it's always retroactively uh, because I don't trade Bitcoin to pay attention to it day to day. Okay. So um, let's get back to the presentation. So um, Mount Gox is kicking off 2013 with their woolly bot helping to drive the price up so they can make their uh, missing bitcoin whole but the biggest thing came uh, in march of 2013. this is what actually finally got me off the couch well not off the couch i was working 12 hour days back then um, this is what got me to finally go and meet a local Bitcoin dealer to buy my first Bitcoin. And these were the events of Cyprus. I knew about Bitcoin back in 2011, but unfortunately, like many of you here, um, we didn't actually buy it back then, okay? Even though I knew about it. Um, I didn't buy it till the events of Cyprus because the events of Cyprus really uh, became interesting to me. Um, and let me zoom in on Cyprus specifically out of Europe. Uh, this is where they had a bank holiday. They shut down. They, um, they shut down the, the banks over the weekend. Your brain just shut down there for a little Yes. <laughs> they, um, they, they shut down the banks over the weekend and, um, they decided to just steal people's money. Um, the initial reports had had it as they were gonna confiscate four, about four and a half percent from everyone. But if you had over a hundred thousand dollars, they were gonna confiscate 9.9 percent .9 of all the money above a hundred thousand um, dollars. And then they decided to okay, let's not touch the money that's under a hundred grand in euros. Uh, but we're gonna confiscate 47% of all the money above $100,000 in your Cyprus bank account. And that's what Cyprus did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Cyprus basically taxed all bank accounts with over $100,000 to the tune of 47%. So if you had 200,000 euros in a bank account in Cyprus, um, you lost $47,000. Well, India was a little different, and I will get to India uh, later on in this presentation. So I remember like this happening, and this really um, finally created interest for me um, in Bitcoin. I went out and bought my first Bitcoins, and I remember when I was talking about this event with my co-workers at, on Wall Street, they were all laughing at me, going, no, this can't happen here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? So... That kind of made me see that, you know what, uh, maybe I'm not the one living in a bubble and uh, there is really something to this Bitcoin thing, okay? So, um, and of course, me being, um, I wasn't as much of an experienced trader back then, uh, but uh, this is what happens. I also bought into the bubble 
uh, the bubble went from about uh, $20 all the way to $250 and I was buying in, right into that bubble and then I watched my position fall all the way down to 50 bucks. So within a month after me buying my Bitcoin, I lost 50% of all the money I put into Bitcoin. And then you have to like, holy crap, what, what, what just happened here? Uh, did I just get scammed? Uh, did I just lose half my money? And then I was sitting on a losing position for a while, right there. And then there was an interesting event, which you can see right here on this little dip, um, where Bitcoin was trading at around 120, and then on October 1st, it dips down to 85 bucks. Uh, what happened October 1st, 2013? Silk Road. Silk Road, exactly. So that's the day Silk Road got shut down by the government. And that day was so funny to me because I was sitting at work and one of my coworkers comes up to me laughing and he goes like this, he's like, haha, Silk Road got shut down. What are you gonna use your Bitcoin for now? Uh, <laughs> now, it was really funny because I've actually never used Bitcoin on Silk Road. Uh, I was never into, um, I mean, I still don't. Um, I don't use any drugs, which in a way is unfortunate. Had I been a drug user, <laughs> I probably would have bought Bitcoin uh, way earlier than uh, 2018. <laughs> like a lot of your priorities change when you get into Bitcoin. Like uh, before I got into Bitcoin, I was all about, you know, libertarianism and uh, government can't do this to us and drugs need to be legal and gambling needs to be legal and like everything needs to be legal and now i'm like ooh, drugs need to be more illegal uh donald trump please cut off remittance to mexico <laughs> uh, you know because if they legalize all that stuff you know people will just use dollars right you want people to use bitcoin so your priorities change uh, <laughs> Right, so, so if you want the price of Bitcoin to go up, you really want the government to double down on the money laundering laws, which I think are just made up laws that are terrible. Uh, so it's like, no, more taxes. Um, like in a way, I was kind of hoping Hillary would get elected because then um, she would like double the amount of taxes and then everyone would just like yeah. hide all their money in Bitcoin and then my <laughs> Bitcoin would go through the roof. Um, <laughs> You know, Donald Trump getting elected, I'm like, all right, at least he hates drugs. Um, at least he hates Mexicans. Um, so he will cut off remittance to Mexico. That would be amazing for Bitcoin. Uh, so, so it's like your priorities completely flip uh, because Bitcoin solves a lot of these problems. Of course. You hold them, but you don't trade them. I don't trade them. No, no, of course. Well, I have, but you uh, still hold them. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I have to. I, let's put it this way. So I have this to, is why you're Bitcoin maximalist. Yes. Uh, and I'm actually gonna hold them. Like if this hard fork happens and the uh, Bitcoin dies, then uh, my life savings die basically. Uh, yeah, like, like my, my, uh, my bank account is, uh, I'm, I'm legally homeless according to the US government. Like literally, like I'm barely paying my bills uh, because there's no money in my bank account. And there's no way. Right. And, um, and I don't even have that much Bitcoin, but I'm not touching it. I'm, like I hide it from myself because um, when I have too much access to my own Bitcoin, I tend to do stupid things like uh, like gamble or... Um, <laughs> you gamble? Well, I used to. When I, when I, one of the reasons why I bought my Bitcoin was to uh, bet on my college football team. Um, Do you play poker? Um, I, 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 tr I try not to place. play poker. Go where? We should go to Sugar House. There's a nice casino right there. There's a casino here? Yeah. Are absolutely. they legal here? In yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. No, you don't want me to go to a casino. Uh, no, I'll play some blackjack at a casino. Does it accept me? Um, no. no, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, 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 no. Like, like, like one of the reasons why I bought Bitcoin was because that year I really wanted to bet on college football. And I was betting on college football with Bitcoin. And then I realized, holy shit, uh, I'm losing Bitcoin. And then I, and then I never gambled again. Uh, so it was a really good, um, it was a really good experience, but uh, but yeah, and I've also invested in some Bitcoin companies that worked out terribly. So me having access to my own Bitcoin doesn't end well. So I try to hide it from myself as long as I know I can get to the private keys. Um, and I'm really in it for the long term. All right, so now we're back to the real bubble of 2013 throughout uh, November. And one of the reasons that caused that bubble was the U.S. Senate hearings where Senator CalPERS 
decided to do a Senate hearing to learn what Bitcoin was. And he took a very good uh, hands-off approach, treating it kind of like the internet. He's like, okay, well, maybe we should give it time like we gave internet time. Um, and those Senate hearings were positive. Tony Gallippi spoke, he did a great job. Um, I, I, I don't remember Andreas Antonopoulos being there, but some of the Bitcoin no, guys spoke. And um, you've been around Bitcoin for a while, haven't you? When did you get in? Um, I bought my first Bitcoin to gamble. Like in, me. In 2011, I believe. See, that's nice. good. Right after Black if I had a If I had a bigger gambling problem, I could have been right there with you. Right after Black Friday. <laughs> um, I, I bought it to, to, I heard about it. I like play poker play or bet on yeah, sports? To, to play poker. Play poker. And so Black Friday just shut down poker. And I used it to like wire yeah. 200 bucks yep. onto like some yep. poker site yeah. in Europe. And I thought it was stupid. And then, uh, so I just put it all on the side so I didn't have any Bitcoin. And then like a year later, the price was like six bucks and I felt mm -hmm. like a champ. And then I had that same bubble you talked about that went all the way to 250. 250, I yeah. I saw the price. 266. I saw the price Ungox. was 100. I was like, what the fuck? I went home, I read about it. <laughs> I read the PDF. The white paper. I was like, yeah, I was like, this is the shit. Yep. The price was 200. I bought, I had the same experience. <laughs> and then I kept uh, buying a little bit. And then That's good. See, I'm an idiot. Like, I quit my job in 2015. If I would only would have kept working my $100,000 plus salary and just converting it to Bitcoin, I'd be a very rich man today. Yeah. But none of you guys would know who I am. So uh, there's good and bad there. I appreciate you. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, so this was the, the Senate hearings that helped drive that bubble. And uh, the bubble hit 1300 and then prices started to come down. And uh, this is also when the Mount Gox pretty much is dying. Uh, the U.S. exchanges got shut down, like Trade Hill, and uh, the Chinese exchanges are taking over all of the volume. All right, so this was the history of the rise of Bitcoin. So do you think that, that the main reason for that, that huge run up in November, December 2013 was just because of those seven years? Not because, but they helped a lot. Mount Gox, Willie Bot had a lot to do with it. And yeah. also, the biggest driver was there was demand for Bitcoin, uh, but there was no supply. Uh, and this is where my uh, little economic, uh, economics 101 formula comes in. We all know that, that the price of anything equals supply and demand. But what is supply and what is demand when it comes to Bitcoin? Bitcoin's different. Demand for Bitcoin is users of Bitcoin, people that want Bitcoin. That's straightforward. The supply of Bitcoin is very different. The supply of Bitcoin is the mining of new Bitcoin. But that is a mathematical, predictable uh, inflation rate. Um, the other supply of Bitcoin is merchant selling. Um, like when you pay to buy something with Bitcoin and they immediately sell it for US dollars, okay? That is also supply of Bitcoin. And in 2013, there was a lot of demand but there was no merchants accepting Bitcoin. Uh, those that were around back then, Expedia accepts Bitcoin, oh my God. You know, like DirecTV, except a lot like Overstock.com, right? All you had to do was be a somewhat recognizable merchant that is now accepting Bitcoin. And there's like a dozen news articles everywhere. But what happened in 2014 was merchants started to come on board and I was involved in, oh, I want to, I guess I'm skipped a little bit. I'll go, I'll get back to that. And I was involved in a few debates uh, where I basically debated saying that, well, if PayPal integrates Bitcoin, get ready for the price to fall from 1300 down to about $30. Because then any business that accepts PayPal will now accept Bitcoin but they don't care about Bitcoin. So PayPal will immediately sell the Bitcoin on the open market and move the dollars to the business. That's not what we need in Bitcoin. What we need is, a, is an economy. You need businesses that accept Bitcoin that will either hold that Bitcoin or try to get their suppliers to accept Bitcoin or try to get their employees to take Bitcoin as a salary. That's what we need. We don't need PayPal. That's not 
what Bitcoin's about. And I remember having these arguments back then. But the way Bitcoin fell is also very, very interesting. Um, Bitcoin on this chart is in blue and um, it's now in a linear scale and not in a logarithmic scale. That's why it looks, uh, the bubbles look so much bigger. So what's the other thing? The other thing has a price drop from $10 to $50. Anybody want to get a guess? Yes, the that is? Room that John Street's family, how they like slandering the white man's name to cover up one of their family members' crimes. And John Street was mayor. He's yeah. got a good voice. Yeah. So sorry, what's that other chart? Like this guy named Williams who used to work for City Hall, who was the armor's division chief, got fired. I was hoping to crack it. Okay, sorry. Set me up. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I apologize. Check it out. I apologize. Thank you. Don't get ready to use more stick ups. That's what I got on my record while I'm robbing them. And if they don't put it on me, I'm going to be no robbing the phone again. God bless you. I'm going to fill you. Yes. So I'm from, I'm from New York. This is, uh, I've seen much worse. Uh, all right, so um, the, the asset in the background goes from a price of $10 to $50. Anybody want to take a guess? Which one? You're going to have to go back 10 seconds before that. <laughs> oh, no, I'm saying um, a Bitcoin is in blue and there is a backdrop of an asset. That has a price from ten bucks to fifty bucks. Anybody want to take a guess what that asset is? Litecoin. Hmm? Litecoin. No, this is way before Litecoin. An asset that had a bubble at fifty dollars uh, and then crashed to ten. Thank you. Silver. Um, Good silver. Job. Um, so the backdrop is silver, and what I use on this chart to point out is that even though Bitcoin fell much faster than silver, they fell in exactly the same way. They have exactly the same pattern. And that's where you can see with the green arrows pointing to the peaks. And then you have these bases. And that it was basically like, like a mirror image. The only difference was Bitcoin was doing it three times faster uh, than silver did. And they, um, they followed the typical pattern of a bubble popping which is a bubble comes to a top and then it falls and then everyone thinks it's okay and then it falls again for real. And you see that in Bitcoin like right here and you also see that in silver like right here and then it really gets bad, okay? So let's talk about the demand for Bitcoin. And the demand for Bitcoin really comes from its users. And um, I wrote an article, wow, this article is like over a year old now, probably pushing a year and a half. Uh, where I talked about the top use cases of Bitcoin. And um, I don't know um, how far back people can see the little screen. Uh, so maybe I can read out my top seven uses of Bitcoin. Um, donations to causes governments don't like. Purchases of goods governments don't like. And that particularly means the drug market. Uh, gambling. Uh, purchases of services the governments don't like and that's mostly prostitution. Um, hiding assets from a soon-to-be spouse, which is, I have a whole description <laughs> of that. Um, hiding, a uh, hiding assets from the government, which is tax evasion. And finally, uh, transfer of value across borders. Uh, these were my top seven uses for Bitcoin, because look, Bitcoin is a permissionless value transfer. If it's only useful when you're being censored. If you're not being censored, just use the dollar. Use PayPal, use credit card, it doesn't matter. Your transactions aren't censored. We need a censorship resistant value transfer and that's what it's good for. Well, if the dollar crashes, that's, that's great for Bitcoin. That's great for Bitcoin. Yeah. So, I mean, that's another but again, right? But is the, is the dollar your, but a dollar isn't, the dollar is more of a currency. Like no one, you don't, you shouldn't hold your, uh, I mean, I think the dollar is strong, only gonna get stronger. But if I lived in any other country in the world, um, I think the dollar will double in value over the next three to five years. I think the dollar is nowhere near crashing. Um, but if I lived in Europe, the last thing I would hold in my bank account is euros. 
I would convert them to dollars or more even better, I would buy the stock market. Um, uh, you don't want to hold your, your savings in uh, any currency. You're, you're much better off putting your savings into the stock market. Says the man who has the savings in Bitcoin. Well, if you don't trust Bitcoin. Um, so I have yes. a question. Um, these use cases, they make perfect sense. I feel like a really big use case is the things that you're doing and that I'm doing, which is investing into this technology. That well, it's probably well, like, we're investing into I'm investing into the technology because I don't believe that the government is going to legalize any of these things. So my investment in the technology is the fact that like like if I if I thought that the world is going to actually eliminate these things from being crimes, I would not invest in Bitcoin. It would be useless. All right. Yes. Yes. Do you expect uh, Walmart, Amazon and the major retailers to accept Bitcoin? Uh, I hope not either. Um, probably not in a while. Um, I, I, I don't really expect it anytime soon. Uh, because they don't need to. Like their customer base doesn't have Bitcoin. There's also from a, from a user perspective, it doesn't make sense to use Bitcoin to buy shit. Because it really doesn't. Bitcoin is expensive. It's a tax pain in the ass. And then when you use it, like you, you just pay a couple of times. You use your credit card, it doesn't right. cost you anything. You use Bitcoin, it costs you like three to five percent. It may the only reason where like I actually use Bitcoin as a consumer is through hers because I save twenty percent. I don't even do that. That may change. These percentages may change. It's they're gonna lower. They're gonna lower. Another reason why I don't, I, I personally don't use purse <coughs> because purse would expose my address and that removes my anonymity. So my anonymity is worth more to me than a 20% Amazon saving. Uh, my anonymity is important to me. So I only use uh, Bitcoin for things like buying a VPN subscription because I wanna keep my anonymity private um, from my VPN, even from my VPN provider. But you buy, how do you buy Bitcoin anonymously? Um, it's hard. Um, I mean, you meet people in like meetups, which is what I did before. Does anybody want to? I have a way to get Bitcoin anonymously. I actually sell it at my business, uh, Liberty X. You yeah. can buy okay. up to $200 a day without any ID at all. Perfect. What uh, what price do you charge? Uh, we have about right now on average an eight percent fee. Eight percent fee, right? So I well, uh, to it's, me it's, it's not for the cash and the yeah. uh, anonymous. So yeah, it's the anonymity premium. Yeah. So for me, I know enough people in the space that I kind of trust that I tell. And I, I actually can't buy any more Bitcoin because I don't make any money. So I just hold on to what I have. Now, the way I do it is I have, well, it's a lot less people now than it was before, but I had enough people that would text me when they needed to sell Bitcoin to pay their bills, and then I would buy that spot. Like I tell, I tell all the people I know, like, hey, if you ever need to pay that phone bill, you have to pay your rent, you know, just text me first uh, and I'll buy it for you. And it's easy for them too, because now they're not hustling. The, 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 it's convenient for them. They shoot me a text, I, I send them some cash and they send me the Bitcoin. And I trust the, pe and I trust the people I work with. So that's how I get it. Um, otherwise, you gotta pay a premium and find local dealers to buy it anonymously. If your anonymity is not important to you, you can always use Coinbase, which I never recommend. Yes? But I mean, for the most part, is it really anonymous? I mean, everybody who has a cell phone here, they know you're here. It's anonymous. It's anonymous enough. Yeah, um, I mean, it, really searches. It, right. It, see, there's there's a big difference between um, there, there's a people don't realize this. There's a huge difference between um, you know some middleman sending your name to the government authority versus the government authority dedicating resources and agents to look for you. Those are two very different things. Um, like people say, well, um, Bitcoin is, is, is not anonymous. I'm like, yeah, but it's permissionless, right? It's not important whether I'm anonymous, I'm all that anonymous to send this money uh, from any part of the world to any part of the world. The important part is nobody can stop me doing it. 
you know, you can try and find me afterwards, but you can't stop me from doing it. And that's the important part that people seem to be missing in this uh, debate of scaling. Uh, because if we lose that ability to send it, the experiment's dead. Uh, we can work on we can work on 100% anonymity later when we need it. We don't need it yet, you know? Uh, but it's also, like I said, it's very different. Um, like, look, if the, if the government wants to devote resources to, to, to catch me, fine. They're not gonna do that because it'll cost them more than whatever they're gonna get. Um, but your bank will send, you know, suspicious transaction reports to the IRS and then they already have your name, right? Different, different initiation. But just so you guys know, like the last article that I read said that there's probably an eighth of the people that use Bitcoin or any other type of alternate coin that have not filled out any tax paperwork at all. Only an eighth? An eighth or, or something like that. That's very little. It was like very small. But, but it was did, very small. Did you hear I can't remember the exact number. Did, small, did small. you read that article that 800 people have filed Bitcoins in their taxes? Yes. And one of those idiots? 800 people in all of America? That was between 20 and 13. Right. But like even then, there, there were millions of people that had Bitcoins. Um, I wouldn't say millions. No? I we're probably so. about 17 Not that many. this moment, right? Hmm? We're around 17 million users around this moment. Um, it's hard to know who the users are. When you ask the wallet creators. Yeah, but like I have like a dozen wallets. Okay, true. Right? And some people's business requires them to have 100 wallets. There's also the, uh, it's a project that's trying to find the right. keys by just random generator. Right, which is a bit of an issue. Um, but that's like saying more than 20 people have Bitcoin now. You think the number is that high? More than uh, what? No, Coinbase has 6 million customers globally, of which maybe, maybe half of Americans. Oh, so that's... Coinbase alone only has like 3 million. Okay. Right, so Coinbase has three million, but I bet you half of those people have less than a hundred dollars in Bitcoin. Right, if they've never taken it. So off does the, 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 are they? Do, no, are do they, they really matter? Do yeah, any of them matter? Like. Uh, but still, eight hundred. I thought was very low. Oh yeah, yeah, no, it's low. Okay, so. But that um, goes back to your theory that a lot of people actually hide, hide their Bitcoins. Yeah. And they should, because if that's that's the use case. That's the use case. The use case is permissionless, anonymous value transfer. It's not perfectly anonymous, but it's anonymous enough if you know how to use it right. Um, all right, so um, I, would, I, out of, I can do a presentation on each of those use cases. Uh, and by the way, notice that like things like purse.io are not on the list, and also things like CryptoLocker are not on the list. CryptoLocker has actually been the most successful project in all of crypto space. Uh, everyone familiar with what CryptoLocker is? Yeah. CryptoLocker is like malware that encrypts your entire hard drive and then puts a message on it in order for you to, op to have access to your own computer. Please send $300 in Bitcoin to the following address and we will decrypt, uh, we will send you the password to decrypt your computer. Um, there is a lots of, it's a huge competition. There's lots of companies that do this. They have some of the best and nicest customer service representatives in the world. Um, you can call them. They will work with you. They will help you acquire the Bitcoin. They will be on the phone with you as you go to a Bitcoin ATM <laughs> machine. Uh, they will walk you through it. Um, if you pretend that you're like very, very poor, uh, you can negotiate a lower price. Uh, they are very reasonable. Uh, they are completely reputation based because um, if they get a bad reputation that they did not go through with un decrypting your computer after you paid the money, no one will ever pay them any money. Now, the, the amazing thing that I learned about CryptoLocker that is doing it is that they've actually been around since 1989. This is not new. Um, your computer has been at, in jeopardy of being totally encrypted um, and then you had to pay to get the password to decrypt it. Only back in 1989, it was known as the AIDS virus and you had to send cash to a PO box in Panama. Uh, the only thing that's changed is the method of payment and they're loving Bitcoin. Over, it's estimated that over a billion dollars 
has flowed into the wallets of crypto locker um, companies. So they are the uh, startup unicorn in the world of crypto, the only one we have. It, it's not one company though, it's about 10 to 15 companies now. I'd like to um, say I actually seen um, an article by Athena Bitcoin that all of their ATM machines had a big warning about these Bitcoin uh, scams to warn people, don't buy Bitcoin from our ATM if it's for these reasons you're being scammed. And I thought that was awesome. They're probably the only Bitcoin ATM company telling you don't buy Bitcoin. That is awesome. That's right. I'm, uh, I'm going watching like a rat go. Oh. <laughs> Again, it's a, it's, a, it's a train station. So it's about a mouse about this big. It's about a, it's a, we're, we're at a train station in Philadelphia. It's okay. Uh, yeah, there's kudos to Athena for yeah. warning people, you know, don't, don't buy Bitcoin here. We want your money, right. but not for this. Right. Um, um, okay, so the, the one uh, use case on this list that I really want to talk about is number seven, which is transferring value across borders, because I think it is the most important use case. And this use case is really going to come to light uh, when Europe finally implodes because of their uh, completely stupid uh, currency. Uh, so the euro is a complete disaster. It, it, it's been mismanaged from the start. Uh, they tried to compete with the U.S. dollar, but they didn't realize that uh, what made the U.S. dollar a success when the states merged is that we had a common language and we also consolidated all the debts of all the states, which Europe did not do. Uh, those countries still have individual culture, individual language, and they did not consolidate the debt. And so, individual countries. And they're still individual countries. Um, which is going to be a big problem for Europe and uh, you already saw Brexit and if Le Pen wins the French election, uh, if France decides to leave, I mean Greece should have already left. Um, so there's lots and lots and lots of problems in Europe and Europe is known to have lots and lots of problems which usually lead to all of them killing each other. Um, and I'm not sure if that is or isn't going to happen again, but it's not going to end nicely. The first time I ever gave this presentation was in, the, in February of 2015, and I clearly said, just wait till this summer when the Greek bank shut down. And that's actually exactly what happened that summer. So ever since then, I've been talking about Italy having a bank holiday. They've came close to doing it twice. They still haven't gotten there yet. Um, and if it's not Italy, it's gonna be Spain. And if it's not Spain, it's gonna be Germany and France. Uh, Germany is having insane problems with the migrant crisis, which they have now plagued throughout all of Europe. Um, I don't know if you're keeping up with those events, but they're pretty bad. Um, so what happens when Europe once again decides to be at each other's throats? Uh, people just get up and leave. And when people get up and leave, they take whatever uh, they have of value and they take it with them. And uh, there are other reasons why uh, a lot of socialist countries start to fall apart and uh, end up with major, major problems. Uh, one of those is, of course, taxes and regulations. So here's uh, my example of the problem with taxes. I was a very early Airbnb user. Look at my phone, but let me check. I was a very early Airbnb user. I loved it. It was great. Saved me so much money on hotels. It was simple. Um, and then one day I was going to a conference in North Carolina. I go to book Airbnb and I'm like, why does this price seem unreasonably high? And I, I looked into it and I'm like, holy shit, when did they start charging taxes? So you can see right there, my room was gonna be 220 bucks. I'm paying 25 bucks for cleaning, and now I'm paying almost $40 for taxes. So my taxes all of a sudden is like 25% of the bill. Which would protect the hotels. Correct. Which is ridiculous. At this point, Airbnb is barely cheaper than hotels. I'm now 50-50 when I travel. Um, and- uh, it's the Same with taxis now in, uh, yep. in Philly. I noticed that like my lift is not cheaper anymore yep. than my taxes. Yeah. I know it's bad. I've been noticing that. Oh yeah, it's bad. And like some states are starting to put in taxes in order to leave that state. And these are problems. Another interesting thing happened uh, a year and a half ago when I was looking at it. Um, 
is that the Airbnb, you know, I had to sign a new terms of service. And usually we all click agree and we never read it. But the scroll bar just seemed smaller than usual. So I decided to copy the contacts, just do a control A, control C, and then control P into Microsoft Word. And I know at the bottom, Microsoft Word counts your words. And I'm like watching it spin for like 45 minutes, trying to count the number of words in this document, which turned out to be 33,000 words. It was like a, uh, like a 40 page document. It was like insane. I'm like, who the hell is gonna read the terms of service? Is this Airbnb for God's sakes? I was using this thing before it even had a terms of service, okay? Um, and uh, you compare it to some of the other achievements where the Declaration uh, of Independence is only 1,300 words and the US Constitution is only 7,000 words and your Airbnb terms of service agreement is now 33,000 words. Um, just as a comparison, Satoshi's white paper was only 3,400 words and now we have Bitcoin. Uh, so Satoshi's white paper was nine pages, 3,400 words. Uh, the Steemit white paper was uh, 44 pages and I didn't really count the number of words, but I did look at that Steemit white paper and I explained the scam on every single page of that paper. In case anyone's curious, you can Google that. And uh, the laws are getting out of control as well. This is out of America right here. Uh, this is one of the laws. Uh, anyone want to take a guess at what piece of legislation this is? Obamacare. That is Obamacare, correct. Um, so that is Obamacare. It's actually 33,000 pages. Um, which is what this is why when people joke around and say nobody knows uh, how Obamacare works, this is why. Uh, because it's uh, a 33,000 page document. Um, when the laws start to get out of control, uh, companies get very, very creative with their disclaimers. Uh, this is Volturo, they convert gold into Bitcoin. You have to agree that you are not a resident of Syria, North Korea, Iran, or the state of New York. Uh, this is because <laughs> of the bit license. A weird place to fall in. What? No, a weird place for New York to fall in. I know. That's their little disclaimer on their website when you go to sign up. It's great. Uh, they were the first ones to do that. It was really hilarious. Um, so, so what is the government doing? And this was great. I recently found this. This is the, actually uh, the Toronto presentation was the fir uh, first one or Miami one, I think. Um, you were in Miami. I think the Miami one was the first time I talked about this. I found this article from the Harvard Business Review. Uh, when did they publish it? They published it uh, in May of 2016. So they published it just about a year ago and they talked about the elimination of cash. So they actually uh, did an analysis and this is great um, because I've been talking about this uh, for a while now, but they actually uh, put some numbers to it. Uh, and they explained it very well, just like I used to, why the governments want to eliminate cash. The governments want to eliminate cash, uh, first of all, because um, people would not be able to go to the bank and take the cash out. So those pictures from the Great Depression of people lined up um, to get you know, $20 out of a bank are identical to the pictures in Greece and Cyprus of people lining up to the ATM and machines India. to get 20 euros out of the ATM machine. The only difference between those pictures is that one's in black and white, one's in color. Uh, other than that, the pictures are identical. So without cash, people would not be able to, like, the, the vis there won't be a panic, there won't be a run on the bank. Uh, you can't have it because there's no cash to withdraw. Now, if there's no cash to withdraw, they're still buying things. They can still buy things, right? I mean, they can limit them, right? You have your credit card, you can put yourself more into debt, and then they can like convert that currency to anything they like. Or you'll have a limit on your debit card of only spending, you know, $35 a day. That's all you're allowed to spend on your debit card. You can see in your bank, it says you have like $20,000, but you're only the government, that you're like your credit card will not work more than $35 a day. That's what they would have done in Cyprus and Greece if, um, um, if there was no cash, if there was no cash, right? Um, instead, their banks just had to shut down because if they were working, people could have withdrawn cash. Um, now, if there's no cash for you to um, go to the bank and just you know, take the cash out, the government can then set any monetary policy that they like, negative interest rates, whatever. They can charge you for having too much money in the bank. Uh, if you don't have the ability to withdraw, 
uh, from the system, then they can do whatever they want with interest rates. You, you really don't have any other options. Uh, this is what Larry Summers wants. He's the father of negative interest rates, and he's also pushing for the elimination of the $100 bill. Um, hey, Tony, how to save this? Yeah. Check the battery life on that. Oh, on your computer? Yeah, you may want to check the battery life. Slide the mouse all the way up. Oh, you're good, 42. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think they're going to be successful with the um, yes. Yeah. Uh, not in the U.S. though. They have to create a false flag first, right? Uh, no, no. Why it's not just in the U.S.? The U.S. is easy. No, U.S. is the most difficult country to eliminate cash. Why? Uh, because the entire world will hate the U.S. The, U uh, the majority of the U.S. dollars are outside of U.S. borders. Yep. Oil to U.S. dollar. Right. Yeah. Uh, there, there is the U.S. dollar is just too important uh, to other countries. Like if, like for example, if the U.S. limits the U.S. dollar. That like half the world, half the third world, is gonna literally implode. Their economies are gonna implode without the U.S. dollar. Aren't they and, um, them? Hmm? Aren't a lot of countries dropping the dollar right now? No, they no. love the dollar. They, they they absolutely love it. It's the most stable thing in the world. Uh, Venezuelans can't. They, they'll do anything for dollars. Um, You're because talking more like bilateral trade agreements yeah. that don't use the dollar now. As I, a that's what currency. I'm looking at right now. Um, that, that doesn't have to do with cash. Yeah. No, that, that's more like, you know, the U.S. is trying to convince some of these more stable countries not to use the dollar because the U.S. doesn't want them using the dollar uh, because they want to eliminate the dollar. But the problem is the third world. The third world, well, I mean, you, the, the U.S. doesn't want half the world to be mad at them, you know, starting another global war because they got rid of the dollar. So the US, it would be very difficult to eliminate the U.S. dollar. There are two important to the world. And it's also good for the U.S. For right. them to use the dollar. Correct. Well, I wouldn't say good. The U.S. would love to get rid of it. They just can't. Uh, because, and this is the next reason is because the U.S. and Europe and, uh, and all these other countries, um, it's Australia especially, um, they think that the reason why they haven't solved all of our problems is because um, all of us are tax evaders and um, we don't pay enough taxes and that's why they haven't you know created utopia yet and that's actually true in India and this article pointed that out um, 30 uh, I think that what was what are the numbers here uh, 30 to 44 percent of Indian GDP is not recorded so the Indian cash economy is so big that uh, 40 percent of GDP is unaccounted for in tax revenue of the country. And this is the biggest reason why India decided to start eliminating cash. But there is a problem. Um, here's a map that uh, Harvard did. Um, uh, and, and in this map, they kind of uh, gave colors to the countries. So blue means it's, it's very cheap for the government in that country to maintain a cash economy. You know, stocking ATM machines, uh, you know, a car, printing the money, distributing the money. And uh, if it's yellow, that means it's somewhat difficult to, or somewhat expensive to the government to maintain a cash economy. And if it's red, that means it costs the government a lot of money to maintain um, a cash economy. And you can see Central Europe is actually red. It costs, Germany spends a lot of money trying to maintain the cash economy, and so does China, and so does India, and so does Mexico. Um, maybe uh, one of the reasons is probably because of too, much, too many laws and regulations that they actually have to you know, prevent money laundering and stuff like that on cash. So that eats up a lot of resources. Also stocking up ATM machines. You know, if the, if the paper is really cheap and it wears out quickly, they have to reprint more money. Uh, they have to protect this money, like ATM machines, uh, armed guards. Uh, so that's what makes it kind of expensive. It is weird that Europe, it's expensive to maintain a cash uh, economy. Uh, Mexico is red, China, India are red. And it's here's- expensive in Austria? Did I see that correctly? Um, that looks like Austria to me. Um, it's that little thing that goes into the yellow. red euro. Austria is yellow. Austria is yellow. Yeah. It's right next to Italy over there. Austria is yellow. Or, or there's something a little blue over there, but that's too small to be Austria. No, um, that is England. Oh, well, no, no, not up there. That's I'm Belarus. down here. That's Belarus. What, what, what's directly next to Italy on the right? 
Yeah. Slovenia. Slovenia, thank you. Um, so they're, they're in blue. Um, and if it's gray, that means they didn't have enough data or it's just a piece of ice. Um, so, but here's another metric, right? So um, again, uh, blue means it's cheap to maintain a cash economy, yellow means it's moderate, and red means it's expensive to maintain a cash economy, okay? But India is super expensive. Uh, India is super expensive to maintain a cash economy, which is why they want to get rid of it. But here's the problem. Um, the higher you are up the chart, um, or I'm sorry, yeah, the, the higher you are up the chart, the more technologically ready your society to eliminate cash, which is why France, Germany, Belgium, and Spain can actually eliminate cash tomorrow and their governments would benefit the most because they spend a lot of money maintaining a cash system and they're technologically ready uh, to eliminate cash. But India is the lowest on that list, which is a huge problem. Like India is not technologically ready. And it's funny that this article from one year ago specifically mentioned that India is nowhere near technologically ready for the elimination of cash. Yet India attempted to do just that, which is why India turned out to be a disaster. And there are other big problems with cash. I don't want to finish this quickly so that we can get the questions. Uh, there are other problems with cash in that like here is uh, France that if you are uh, a European citizen, you will need to provide identification for any transactions over 1,000 euros or even if you just want to exchange 1,000 euros. Uh, here is an example out of Louisiana here in the US where they passed a law which has now become very hard to Google or document, but there is a statute for that law where Louisiana made it illegal to sell secondhand goods for cash. So if you're having a garage sale and you want to sell that bicycle for 20 bucks, um, accepting ca a $20 bill for it is actually illegal. Um, so you have to do it by check or you better get a credit card machine or something. I've also heard that it's illegal to have cash in a bank deposit box in America. Yes, it is also. Uh, I mean, there, there are some small limits, but yes. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's getting bad when it comes to cash. And again, it's great to be a Bitcoiner. Um, so here's an example out of Germany. So I'm not going to read this, but Germany put in laws where, because Germany knows exactly what it's like to move values across borders. During World War II, people like converted their money into anything of value, whether it was, you know, paintings, bottles of wine, they would build, you know, fake wine cellars. You've heard these stories, I'm sure. Um, anything to like hide your value. So what Germany is doing is they're putting in laws because they're saying that there are too many terrorists um, excavating archaeological sites and trading in um, ancient artifacts uh, that anything of historical value uh, now needs to be registered. Anything over a hundred dollars in uh, collector's value now needs to be registered. Uh, and KYC'd mostly because they want to tax you on it. So that's exactly what uh, Germany is doing. So what happens when people get fed up and they decide to leave? Well, here's the population of Rome. The population of Rome peaked at one and a half million people in the year 400 AD. And, uh, and then the population of Rome started to collapse. Um, it has recovered since then. We're now all the way up here, but it took a while. Um, and as the population, of course, crashed, you see the typical bubble where everyone comes back and then boom, they go back down uh, following the typical bubble chart. Um, it, this uh, population of Rome chart is from Martin Armstrong. Um, he's one of the economists that I actually pay attention to, though I have been too busy to read his blog. Uh, so I thank him a lot for this chart. It's great. What's his and name again? Martin Armstrong. Strongly recommend his blog. I really wish I had time to read it these days. Um, and um, uh, there's it follows the typical bubble chart. The population of Rome bottomed out at 20,000 people after reaching the heights of one and a half million. It bottomed out. It took a thousand years for the population to bottom out. Um, and here's the problem with gold. Uh, when you decide to actually get up and move, um, you want to back in the day you used to put your money into gold and take it with you uh, the problem is with our technology metal detectors have made that very very difficult and most of us travel by plane 
and here is even a customs card from one of the countries where they don't own they don't only ask you if you have gold bullion, they ask you if you're wearing any gold jewelry because there is a limit how much gold jewelry you can wear uh, when you're flying into this country. So it makes it very difficult to move your value cross borders. And here is an example both from TechCrunch. Um, one is four months before the Greek crisis. A headline on TechCrunch says that why Greece should not switch to Bitcoin. Um, and then uh, a few months after the Greek crisis, Bitcoin provider Qubits aims to help Greeks move their money. Um, so that's from the same publication. All right, so I, I like to conclude this presentation with my views on the Bitcoin price. Uh, this is uh, one of the articles I wrote at Cointelegraph in August 2013 of 2014. So this article is now almost three years old. I wrote this article in August, uh, in August of 2014, and I played around with some time analysis. I mostly do price analysis. This was my little time analysis where I wanted to pick critical cyclical dates. And some of you are here that are into cyclical trading where certain dates repeat. So I used the basics of Martin Armstrong's economic theory and I put a time analysis onto this to find key dates in Bitcoin. And even though this was done in the summer of 2014, my key dates were the middle of June 2015 and then coming up in August of 2017. I didn't really think anything of it. I had the exact date. Uh, it's not written in this article, but you can figure out the exact date. All you have to do is convert 0.46 into days out of a year. So it's 365 times 0.46, and then you count how many days that is. And uh, this was supposed to be my critical date. And uh, at the time, I didn't know if that date would lead to a high or a low in the price. But as uh, the winter of 2015 or the winter of 2014 came around, it was obvious to me that we were on a downtrend. And I was looking for a low in price um, in the middle of June 2000. Um, 15 and it so happens that it corresponded to the events of the Greek shutdown to within a day of uh, the date that I picked out a year earlier. Now I was looking, uh, it's hard to see on this, I was looking for this day uh, to come with a lower price of Bitcoin. I was looking for Bitcoin to go as low as 110, 110, 120. Bitcoin had fallen to about 150 in January of 2015, and then it fell again to 160 um, in like um, September of 2015. I was hoping that it would perfectly bottom out on this day um, in the summer at around 110. Um, I did not get my price right, but I got the time right. And ever since that summer, I have been bullish Bitcoin. Uh, I was very hated in 2014 and 15 for being continuously bearish on Bitcoin, but that's what the charts told me. And I've been very bullish ever since. And uh, here are all of my other predictions. So you basically think that there's going to be a peak this year in August? Yes, it's because my next critical date is in the middle of August. Uh, 2017 so I've been looking for a peak in price this August I've been talking about a peak in price this August uh, for over a year now if not two okay so I've always been looking for prices to peak this August okay. uh, I've been talking about that since uh, for over a year if you if you find videos of these presentations over a year ago you'll hear me talk about this August being a peak in price am I gonna be right I have absolutely no idea <laughs> well let me get to the to the last chart on this list here um, so here are all of my views um, I never deleted any of these lines um, those that watched me do this presentation in Miami would have seen me put this arrow right there where I said 760 is uh, is the low price uh, this was the arrow I put in Miami and it worked out perfectly and I was looking for that 760 to be a low these are just some of the tweets that were going down in real time where people when the price was crashing 
and people said, oh, 900 is a great buy. I replied saying, no, no, 750 to 775 would be a perfect buy. And the middle of that is 760. In other tweets, I specifically said 760. And then right after it turned right at 760, uh, people replied basically, holy shit, if it never goes below 760 again, Tone had the best call on the price. Uh, so all these tweets are out there in real time. Now, I'm not always right. As far as my view, here is me being quoted um, on January 3rd of this year. And I will just uh, read the quote. I see a very strong start to 2017. A lot depends on Segwit passing, but it will be uh, the confidence and speculation in the eventual consensus on Segwit being passed. That should drive the price as high as 2000 by end of summer. Um, just like what happened with the halving. So, uh, and then I said after it reaches 2000 this August, um, I'm looking for a pullback in price to close the year between 1500 and 1750. So that was my outlook for the year as of January 3rd. I am still sticking with that prediction of uh, approximately 2000 by late August, followed by a bit of a dip, uh, but I remain bullish on the price of Bitcoin. Um, here is me. Um, I, these charts are a little out of date by like a month. Um, this is not my computer, so I don't have it like in the background. But if you go to my YouTube channel, if you Google me, uh, I do twice a week, uh, twice weekly videos about the price of Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, you can see all of these charts and their latest updates on my YouTube channel. I also do a live Q&A. So I talk about the markets for maybe, I talk about stock market, S&P 500, gold, oil, uh, euro, and Bitcoin. That takes about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Then I you know, rant about whatever I wanna say in the Bitcoin space. And then I open it up to live uh, Q&A. I currently have about 250 live viewers, which is going up quickly. I may have to, I, I get way too many questions. Some of these videos now last three hours, but the majority of it is Q&A. Um, so you can ask questions. I'm thinking of moving it to some kind of a paid model, at least make people pay a dollar. Uh, it will be something very, very reasonable, uh, but I haven't figured all that out yet. Have you um, seen the model from 21? The, where, the, where the you can company like, 21 that, yeah, company. that managed to lose $100 million on, yeah, yeah. on Nintendo? Okay, go on. But they have like this, this new product now that is probably also silly. But um, it's interesting where they allow you to like contact you when, when you don't have access um, by, by paying basically for it. And depending on how famous you are you can basically adjust the price but you can also use like futurenet futurenet's doing that where you can actually put your videos and then you would have them locked unless they pay for them yeah i'm supposed to have a podcast with the futurenet people i think it's nonsense but we'll see i'm here are you a <laughs> futurenet yes I'm are you future a user or did you help build it no i'm 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 actually a consultant with them as well now okay yeah uh what's the ceo's name uh I just got in this week, okay. so I don't know all the names well, off the top I'm supposed of my head. To, um, I, I know I, he's in uh, Poland. And yes, he's, he's in, in Poland. Yeah, yeah. Warsaw. Um, and uh, I know uh, Ryan. Uh, Ryan Conley. Conley. I, well, he said he would talk to you guys if you guys wanted me to put him on. Well, um, I, I, I have like, yeah. I have like messages from Ryan that I need to listen to. Well, you know, but, uh, you gotta, you gotta put those messages to the back burner and think about business. <laughs> well, right. Well, my business is exposing. Um, scams yeah. so i uh, will uh oh yeah so uh, future net tell me because i mean i'm the first well, one here right it is. Um, it's like everything's a scam well no well, that's the thing right i mean i told them i'm like look if you want to come on my show if you want to come on my show if you want to come on my podcast i'm going to ask you hard questions and uh this is your chance i mean it's not going to end well for your project but uh, go on <laughs> yeah like if uh if you, if you can if you can answer my questions you'll, you'll do amazingly but no one ever does um, so, uh, good luck. Um, I'll bring them on. <laughs> I mean, uh, so so they're, they're, I'm supposed to do a podcast with uh, FutureNet. 
Um, I think it's another Steemit, which I immediately called out as a scam and proved it. Uh, I have so much, so many videos, so many documents on that. Uh, all right, any other questions, guys? Um, I, I have a question. What the hell am I supposed to do with my Bitcoin if this port happens? Um, <laughs> do I have my hardware wallet? Do I put yes, you keep it on your hardware wallet. What, what is your hardware is? wallet? Ledger? Ledger Blue. Uh, just double check with Ledger. I know if you have a Trezor, you're okay. Yeah. Just keep them on there. Um, if you have an SPV wallet, I mean, it also depends on which side you, you support, right? Like, for example, I support... What if you don't know what side to support? What, you mean? what if you're just a person who just got into Bitcoin last month and you're now all of a sudden dealing with this fork topic? Just make what sure do you, you recommend that person do? Just make sure you have your private keys. Yeah, you uh, if you're on a... If you're on a, coin survives, uh, if you're on a hardware survives. wallet, you should be fine. If you're on an SPV wallet, like I have Airbits, and Airbits takes the position that... Um, Whichever chain is going to be the longest is going to be the, the chain. And I don't agree with that policy, which is why I'll probably be moving my coins over to the core wallet, which is the wallet created by the Bitcoin core developers, which they recommend not to you know, use as your day-to-day -day wallet, uh, but they're safest there because I trust the core developers. So I would be running a SegWit node uh, because I want to support core. I think Bitcoin Unlimited is a hostile attack to take over Bitcoin for personal gain. Um, I do not agree with it. I am, uh, I've been in furious debates with Bitcoin Unlimited supporters. I, I probably will not be good friends with anyone that supported Bitcoin Unlimited, even though these were good friends of mine before this whole thing started, because I think it's just a hostile takeover of the Bitcoin ecosystem. So why, why exactly do you think it's hostile? Well, they're not in consensus. They want to, they, and they want to kick out the smartest people that have been programming for five years. Have you guys seen that they just used unopened source code? Well, they don't know what they're doing. Yeah, they, that's what I was just going to answer. That, that was my tweet. About that. Well, no, what I think about it is, and I replied, I, re I replied to Whale Panda. I'm like, well, these developers are so incompetent, they probably don't know what open source code is. Um, I mean, this is how bad it is. I mean, it's just uh, pure incompetence. Uh, it, it, it's literally like... Uh, right, but that does not explain why it's hostile. So you said it's hostile. So I, that, that's something I don't understand. To me, Bitcoin is a decentralized protocol, right? It won't be if Bitcoin Unlimited yeah. is programming. That's the hostility. So. Can you make that same argument with Blockstream right now? Right. Well, no. Blockstream is one of about four companies programming for Bitcoin Core. So first off, when do we get to the point where core developers were contracted under these companies that feed them salaries? Is well, that that that. that, 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 that huge well, okay, fine. I mean, you get uh, because someone has to pay them, or they will leave for for Wall Street jobs, right? Uh, have you been paying them? Have you ever supported core development? No. No. Well, neither have I, right? And Roger, and they tell Roger, or oh, Roger, well, you've never gave us a dime. Uh, someone needs to, someone needs to pay for the maintaining of the Bitcoin code. And um, a couple of people got together, formed a company, and they went and raised money in order to keep some of the best core developers on payroll. Now, Blockstream has the most money and they pay the most developers. They pay about uh, 10 to 12 developers full time. There is another company that pays like two developers full time. There is another company that pays like one developer full time. There's another company that pays one developer full time. I think MIT um, may be paying more core developers now Maybe, right. Now, those are just but, a, but again, those are the full-time developers. There's an addition, like a hundred other people that are contributing to Core for free. If they become important enough and good enough, someone might be willing to pay them a salary, okay? But the point is that these people, and look at their histories. They have a history of programming like for freedom. You know nothing about the, the Bitcoin Unlimited developers. There's only like six of them. And who knows who's paying them? Well, who's paying them? Do you think that blockchain itself has conflict of interest no. with other organizations? It, it, it's, irre it, it's irrelevant because um, the people that they're paying 
it, it's like basically um, the, the people that they're paying are some of the are ba oh, let's put it this way right like you know what Julian Assange did you know what uh, Snowden did if someone created an organization that told Julian Assange and Edward Snowden hey guys we have an office for you why don't you come work out of this office you do what you what needs to be done and we will pay you do you think Edward Snowden and Julian Assange would now be compromised regardless of where the money came from their salary is open hey Julian Assange we will pay you a hundred thousand dollars a year so you can you know pay your bills and don't do anything else uh, Edward Snowden will pay you a hundred thousand dollars a year we're not talking like billions of dollars here right does it really matter where that money came from if you trust those people to do what needs to be done this is what we have right now with core development one financial institution contributed money to 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 blockchain just one it's an insurance company excellent excellent right yes i know the ceo of axa is also the chairman of the bilderberg uh but you got to stop believing in conspiracy theories uh the bilderberg controls the world like the satoshi round table event where they just get together and have drinks controls bitcoin um so but, but i still don't understand what's hostile about this so well they're trying to hard fork bitcoin to create two bitcoins right and, and they but, and they swore to attack the the traditional bitcoin chain so that it doesn't work so that everything is bitcoin trying unlimited. to break down bitcoin basically tear it apart right well the the point is it's a decentralized protocol and the right. governance system of a protocol like that is that you have the right to propose rule changes sure and the world cannot accept these rule changes or they can accept these rule changes sure. i don't find that hostile i find that just a normal uh, consensus mechanism of okay does it bother you that the person that's most um involved in promoting it owns the website bitcoin.com yeah i yes. bothers me okay right um that person also happens to have the biggest bitcoin position other than satoshi you know yeah, how much does he have nobody knows he won't disclose if i if i don't any i wouldn't would either if you? i had to people say as much as three hundred thousand bitcoin i think that's a little high if i had to guess i'd say about a, a one to 150. my best guess i know nothing though i don't have any evidence so just my logical guess um and they've been they've tried this before bitcoin xt yeah. didn't work bitcoin classic didn't work but and now not, they're doing it's, bitcoin it's unlimited not, it's not a big deal the market is just gonna fix it well so like i hope have, so if you have two forks the market is gonna kill one yeah but i'm sure that's what they said in russia 70 years ago right oh just a couple of guys you know capitalism is gonna fix it ethereum classic and ethereum are still button heads yeah I mean, uh, that's the thing. I don't want Bitcoin to split in two. I, I think Bitcoin would die. Yes. So if you're calling for a high still in August, obviously you don't think it, the, the, the fork will happen. Uh, I don't know if the fork is or isn't going to happen. I don't think it will happen. That's independent of my price high. Uh, the, the, the pr this is what I try to tell people, right? Like my views on the price of Bitcoin has nothing to do with my feelings about Bitcoin all they have to do is with charting yeah. it's just math the math is telling me that bitcoin is going to be is going to reach a high in august and my best guess is going to be about 200 bucks two thousand bucks um i have no idea what's going to happen my guess is that there's not going to be a fork and we may or may not get segwit but we don't need to get segwit again price and reality are two different things okay um even if like BU miners are like 80 percent it's still insanely hard to actually fork. right not to mention the nodes are 80 percent for segment right so even if there's 80 percent mining on bitcoin unlimited they're only going to be able to sell that bitcoin to 20 percent of the users because the rest of the users like myself will not accept a bitcoin unlimited token so you wouldn't be able to send it to me i, I would ignore it but my price is independent right so 
uh, when I talk about price, and I'm and I was calling for a 915 low, like people were like selling Bitcoin uh, last week because of all this mess, and I said my charts are telling me that 915 is a buy point. And that's it, and uh, I'm sticking with the charts. If the charts tell me that the price is going to go down, then I'm going to say that the price is going to go down. Right now, charts are still saying it will go up. Um, can the charts change? Of course. Can my views change? Yeah. But uh, right now, I'm still looking uh, for the price of Bitcoin to go up. Now, I don't believe the fork's going to happen. I think it's all bullshit. Uh, I think Roger is serious, but I don't think the Chinese miners are going to do it. Now, even if they fork... Um, I also, I also think yep. that uh, BU, it, it, they make it really hard for BU to work well, economically. It, well, and not only economically, technologically, right? Because uh, Bitcoin Unlimited is built on over a year old uh, Bitcoin uh, core client. So Bitcoin Unlimited is like 50,000 lines of code behind. <laughs> and they don't have enough developers to even catch up. Like they live, Bitcoin Unlimited would set Bitcoin back technologically two years. Like it's it, assuming the code works, which is very very debatable these days. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. We're getting kicked out. <laughs> I think it looks like we're done. Yeah. All right, after uh, Tone Bay's Bitcoin talk, we're at the bar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gracias. Hey guys, thank, thank you for inviting me. To the moon, to the moon. No. Um, to Bitcoin. 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 Cheers. Bitcoin. Woo! Wow. <laughs> Yo. Yeah. Woo. Nice. Turning the meat up front is a good use. No.